<laughs> I've aged definitely over the last eight years, but Helmut Marko had announced me as the, as the new team principal, and um, you know, I didn't want to let him down. And did I feel ready? Probably not. <laughs> when I first joined Red Bull, um, huge change culturally for me. The easy thing was to stay at McLaren and carry on there, it was comfortable. But I just felt I needed a new challenge. I felt I was getting a bit stale at McLaren. It was quite clear that Red Bull's objectives in Formula One weren't to be a stiff corporate partner. They wanted to break the boundaries. They wanted to do things differently. And there was a much more fun vibe about the team. Just before the Silverstone race, I walked into the paddock. This character sprung out from behind the, uh, one of the trucks and said, Psst, yeah, Adrian, my name is Dr. Marco. I am from Red Bull. We would very much like you to join. Here is my card. You will ring me. I thought, <laughs> hmm, am I making the right decision here? But um, of course, Helmut, actually, once you get to know him, is a, is a fantastic guy. He's passionate about the sport. He's passionate about what the team does. And uh, he'd hate to hear me say it, but he's a big softy, really. The thing I like about Helmut the most is that he's, he's a racer. Clearly, he likes the team to be successful, and he's, and he's driven. Yeah, I do my thing, he does his thing. Um, you know, it's, it's obviously clear that he has, you know, more of a, I suppose, affinity for Seb just because they come through, brought Seb up through the ranks. With me, he has been very straightforward, very honest. Um, so he has given me a hard time, <laughs> I remember. Uh, and he still is, to be fair. So, um, but I really um, appreciate the, yeah, respect we share and the uh, relationship that we have. People saw Red Bull, certainly in the, in the early days, as a party team. I think people mistook that for not being serious about what we wanted to achieve. It was quite a dysfunctional team in many ways. The old Jaguar culture of, we know best, we know what we're doing. I remember Dietrich had set a target that year to exceed Jaguar's previous point score, which was nine points. And in one race, we'd already achieved that. Well, this was the first time we turned up in, in Monte Carlo. We decided to do something a bit different, and so painted the car in Star Wars colors for a movie that was released at, uh, uh, at that time. And it was the first time that people, I think, really started to see what Red Bull was capable of um, you know, outside of the track. We put the, the energy station in the harbor um, for the first time, and uh, prior to the Monaco race, they did a, a preview of the movie at the, uh, at the circuit. And uh, Adrian came along to that. I think he fell asleep about a quarter of the way through. But it was really the start of me trying to engage with him. I must admit, I just like Christian, the way he conducts himself. He struck me as a guy that would be, you could have a good working relationship with. This was 2006, and we'd had a horrible start to the year, and Martin Brundle had said he was convinced DC was gonna be on the podium that weekend. So I said, look, I will jump naked into the swimming pool if uh, DC you know, is on the podium. Suddenly we're fifth, and then we're fourth, and then, and then we're third, and that, that was the first podium you know, for the team, so it was a, it was a massive achievement. Suddenly my phone started going mad and somebody told me that Martin Brundle had announced to the British public that I was going to do a naked jump into the swimming pool and being, being a man of my word, I, couldn't, I could not do it. Yeah, this looks like the first photo shoot at the launch of RB3, wow. Yeah, I just left Williams after a very difficult phase, pretty much trying to restart my career, to be honest. I suppose what I expected to do at Williams, uh, what was now possible at Red Bull, and that was win and challenge for championships uh, at the front of the grid. DC had been in the team for a while, so to have that experience together with ourselves and that hunger and drive, and then the freshness when Seb arrived was, uh, you know, we haven't had many drivers at the team, but we've been successful. I must admit, I got to the end of the first full year, the end of the RB3 season, and thought, Adrian, you've really bitten off a big one here. That was the time when we announced, um, yeah, the move from uh, Toro Rosso to Red Bull Racing. In a way, it, thanks to David uh, retiring, there was a space, and uh, I got the job. It was absolutely no-brainer. He deserved a chance in the team, um, and 
as he's rightly shown to this date, obviously he's a phenomenal world-class driver. It was clear he was a talent. I didn't know actually how good he was going to be at that stage. It became clear very early that uh, he was strong, he was quick, and we started the professional relationship from, uh, from that day onwards and we've, we've done a lot since. I look back now, it's nice, but also makes you realise that uh, a lot of time has gone by and um, a lot of, lot of things has, have happened since. Yeah, this is rehab uh, after I broke my leg in 2009. Mark's partner gave me a, a call, Anne, and said, um, now I don't want to worry you, but uh, Mark's had an accident on his Tasmanian challenge and um, he's broken his leg. You know, I lost a bit of confidence, I suppose, knowing that I couldn't do the training that I wanted to do. You know, he got pins in his legs and it was a multiple compound fracture on his, on his right leg. And uh, I would think he was probably nervous that, you know, is this the end of my career? Yeah, I, just, I was just so disappointed with the swelling of my leg and I was getting down and I was depressed. But, uh, you know, he got himself ready and his trainer, you know, Roger Cleary, did a, did a fantastic job with him. To be honest, he probably shouldn't have driven the car when he did at the beginning of February in 2009. He could barely stand. Um, you know, I remember there being a stool in the garage that he had to keep using to sit on. But he was, he was resolutely determined that he was going to get in the car and, and drive, and, uh, and he did just that. And uh, it probably took him longer than he actually let on to, uh, you know, to recover. first win was in China 2009. Um, little known fact but the, uh, the left hand handle on the trophy actually fell off and I picked it up. The first win with Red Bull Racing was obviously uh, something very special. It was a, a kind of a breakthrough. We had this huge regulation change and so all the established principles kind of went out of the window. It's now about okay what is the best design to suit these new rules. I'd watched for years other other drivers other team principals going and collecting trophies and to suddenly you know join that club was was phenomenal my first first grand prix victory it was definitely a huge relief i had you know everyone was saying it was mine to lose, all that sort of stuff. He was massively quick that weekend, he qualified on pole. I just knew that I had to get away well, which wasn't too bad, um, but I had contact with Rubens off the line. Got a drive through, then he came back incredibly quickly. I thought, my God, yeah, this is not gonna happen. Have I blown it? He was overcome with emotion, which was, which was great to see. I remember saying to myself when, uh, look at that, I just said, yeah, I don't give a shit. Yeah, it was for me. Brazil 2009 and we were fighting for the championship until the last race. I think unlike a lot of people in the whole paddock, we always kept believing the whole year that we can still, you know, still do it. At the end of that year, there was enormous fear when we did miss out on the championship that kind of that's it. Our one chance for our five minutes of fame had, had passed. Whereas if you win, obviously everything is rather crazy. When you lose, yeah, you have time for yourself. Nobody, you know, is interested. You have time immediately to let the emotion sink in. And if I look back, seeing that the image, I know exactly, you know, what I felt. And I was crying after the race. You know, you don't know how many chances you get in your life to fight for the world championship. You know, it's, it could be over tomorrow. Really to come that close and then to miss the target, you know, that's, yeah, it's a very strong emotion. The RB6 was, performance-wise, a, a very dominant car. We made heavy weather it in the start of the year, but by mid-season, we were just on a roll. To win your first Monaco Grand Prix, but to do it with a one-two finish, doesn't get, doesn't get bigger than that. That race was probably the biggest highlight of my career. Yeah, Mark was a little bit in the league of his own the whole weekend, and. Uh, yeah, I wasn't quite able to match him, so uh, came second, but it was fantastic for the team to win in Monaco. Just putting that whole weekend together in terms of momentum and inertia, and then finally 
crossing the line. It's such a pokey little venue, it's such a challenging little track. Everyone was extremely happy. I think there was no one that uh, came out dry out of the celebrations because we have this pool on the energy station and then I said, let's jump into the sea. Seb's idea, Seb said, there's no way we're getting off this thing that direction. So we both started to look, well, let's just go off the back here. And we launched and uh, soon worked out that the harbour is not as clean, as pretty as it looks. So they both jumped in and, and, and nearly drowned because their, their suits obviously became heavy and then, and then um, couldn't get out of the water. Then suits are bloody heavy. When you get them wet, I'm like, you know, I'm a pretty decent swimmer, but I'm like, bloody hell, this is, this is pretty heavy, mate. I actually couldn't get out of the pontoon because I was, I weighed a ton, but uh, yeah, it was good fun. We've achieved the heights of winning a 1-2 in Monaco and it doesn't get bigger than that and we've taken the championship lead in the drivers and the constructors and then suddenly we turn up in Turkey and you know, we got ourselves into a position where we're, our two drivers are fighting for the lead and then the worst possible thing that you can have happen as a team is your two drivers make contact with each other. Mark was in the lead, I was in second and uh, I was getting ready to try to, to overtake him and then uh, we touched, we, we made contact and uh, it was the end of my race and uh, compromised Mark's race as well. It was one of the first times that I've been, uh, and I think actually the only time <laughs> I've been booed on the podium when I got a trophy and I still don't know who was booing me but uh, there was obviously a lot of tension within the team. I was furious, absolutely furious, you know, because from a team point of view, it was a win, it was a Grand Prix victory, which is so hard to achieve. And then to see that slip through your fingers and gift the other team a one-two finish in what was a massively tight championship that year was very, very tough. It was tough for, for everyone in the team. Yeah, just massively pissed off. Yeah, we all worked so hard, everybody at the factory and the organisation work so hard to do the best possible job we can and we genuinely try to give both drivers exactly the same amount of support. And I was actually quite, you know, resolute in the fact that yeah, okay, it happened, we'll get on with it. It took a long time for the relationship between the two of them to heal after that incident. Nothing like that had ever happened to the team before and uh, yeah, a real, real low point for the team, but, but something we needed to learn from quickly. I think both of us weren't very happy. Obviously, uh, we've spoken about it many times, but I think the most important, we learned our lesson. And uh, since then, I think we raced each other hard, uh, gave a little room, but always enough room to survive. Yeah, hard to recover from, but we did, of course. career was, uh, I mean, we were at a critical stage of the championship, three races to go. 1-2 on the grid, leading 1-2 in the early laps of a wet race, and he just overdrove it, made a mistake, crashed. Very, very disappointed, obviously, uh, that I lost the car. Uh, it's not often that I've crashed out of a race on my own. Sebastian was then leading very comfortably. He'd done all the hard work, he, he got himself back into the drivers' championship. The light was failing, the track was starting to dry, the tyres were wearing out and with literally, I think, within five laps of the finish, he had a spectacular engine failure. Obviously it was really frustrating. I knew exactly what it meant for the championship. Uh, Fernando then taking the, the, the victory. It was just the lowest possible point that I can remember in, in motorsport at that time and uh, a double DNF. And effectively, our driver's hopes had gone up in, in engine smoke. And I knew that whatever I do, the way I behave when I come back in front of the team, that was the most important to me. So show to the team that, OK, it's a step back, but we still have it in our hands. We can still turn this around. Everybody had, you know, they were totally deflated. I do remember the long drive back from the circuit to the airport at Seoul, about a four-hour drive in traffic jams, just being utterly depressed. 
we win together and we lose together, you know. It's the team, it's the engine, it's the combination that puts us in that position in the first place. So without them, you wouldn't even have the luxury to complain. He f refused to accept defeat. He refused to accept that was the end of his, his championship challenge. His attitude in, in that adversity was hugely impressive. Brazil 2010, where we won the Constructors' Championship, incredible feeling. It means that you've been better than Ferrari, you've been better than McLaren, better than Mercedes-Benz, all these other teams. To have taken them on and to have beaten them was, you know, it was massive, absolutely massive. Just an amazing feeling. A lot of people when I left McLaren felt that career-wise I was kind of committing suicide. There been an article on the front cover of one of the monthly magazines saying his knew he lost it. So to kind of say, well, no, not yet. I remember going to a party on the way back to the airport that night and um, we actually got thrown out of our own party. Um, Adrian nearly got involved in a fight. Um, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was an incredible day. This was Abu Dhabi, so against all the odds, um, Sebastian won the Drivers' World Championship. And it was really special to have Dietrich there that day. He doesn't come to many races. He, he likes to keep a very low profile. But it's his support, his vision and encouragement that's enabled us to achieve what we have. And that was what was so special, that he was there in Abu Dhabi to witness Sebastian becoming the first Drivers' World Champion for, for Red Bull. I crossed the line and I was empty, you know. I started crying under the helmet and uh, it was very difficult to find, you know, the voice to, to talk to the team, to respond. Um, and on the podium as well and the whole, whole night after that, uh, yeah, it was a bit like a rush, you know. It just, uh, it was very difficult for all of us, I think, to understand what we have achieved. It took about another month before realization finally set in that we'd won the Constructors and Drivers World Championship. And even if we achieved nothing else in the sport, nobody could take that away from us. Since 2010 in particular, the level of sniping at us just got a bit silly, to be honest. It seemed like every race we were accused of doing something illegal. The car, of course, was using the regulations to the edge, that's to me what you should do with Formula One. There's no such thing as the spirit of the regulations, it's the black and white print of you can't do this, you can do that, and we took the can-do bits right to the edge. Bottom line is the car was legal, we won the races. This was a big pass. Unless you've been to our rouge, you don't see how steep it is on the run to Arouge. This is two world-class drivers giving each other just enough room and respect. We plummet downhill and then you, you smash into the bottom of our rouge. At this stage, I remember turning away because I couldn't even watch the screen. And I just had the inertia and I just pulled to the left and I thought, yeah, I can make this work here now. You're on the edge of your seat because you don't know whether it's going to come off or whether they're going to both end up in the fence. You'll look back at that in years to come and say, you know, that's when you're at your, at your peak performing well. Uh, and driving against the best and sometimes beating them. For us not to win in 11 by halfway through the year, we could only screw it up ourselves. Um, and so it was more inevitable. But you never take anything for granted. And when we won the Constructors World Championship in, in Korea, which was the scene of our most disappointing race the previous year, you know, it was a tremendous feeling that you've taken on some phenomenal teams and you've come out on top, you know, it was a truly, truly great, great feeling. The first one is unique because it's the first one, you never achieved it before, you don't know what to expect, you don't know what to experience. Obviously there was a little bit of a build up to the championship in 2011, but uh, still I think we never allowed ourselves to, you know, drift away and um, get, it, get over excited. And even if there was only one more point we had to get in four or five races, still you have to get the point first. The story behind the picture is actually that I was standing on the pit wall and there were still a lot of fans on the, on the grandstand. You know, it's a special thing about Japan. The people are 
just Formula One fans, and uh, it was really special to, to see so many people still still there on the grandstand across the circuit waiting. And uh, I think it was special for for me, but also special for the whole team. You know, I, I took some of the mechanics up and so that they could see what I see. The first win of the season in 2012 was a very big relief. We were fighting to get performance back onto the car. McLaren at that stage were looking very, very strong. We were in a luxury position in 2011, winning so many races. And at the beginning of this year, we weren't. We simply were not in the position to you know, fight for victory. You know, Sebastian qualified the car on pole and then drove a, a fantastic race under a lot of pressure from Kimi Raikkonen. It does taste simply the best when you're on the top step and you win the race and uh, the first win of the season was a big relief in that regard. It was fantastic to get that first win on the board and um, yeah it was a sense of a sense of relief uh, you know it was an important moment for this year. Winning in Monaco is just special there's not much more you have to say. Monaco is the jewel in the crown and it means something that little bit more and uh, uh, we've been fortunate enough to win the Monaco Grand Prix three years in succession. It was a tough Grand Prix uh, to win there. It's just winning twice, I think. You know, it's the grand slam of our season. If you want, any driver wants to win a race, we know that uh, that one's very, very special. It's just a wonderful feeling you know, when, you, when you win in Monaco. Valencia this year was, uh, I think, obviously a low of the season because we didn't finish. We were in the lead and we had a fantastic race. And then we had the problem with the alternator. It reminded me in a way of Korea because, you know, obviously it makes you angry. It's nothing you've done wrong. But I was just, you know, disappointed and angry that we didn't finish the race. No way we, you know, stopped believing in, in the championship or you know, thought that we are in a much worse position now because there was still such a, a long way to go. I've just got so many great memories at Silverstone and that is absolutely just another one of them. And we had, you know, the crowd coming onto the track. You just realise how big the sport is or how people want to get close to the drivers and want to share the day with us. The connection was probably at at, at its highest from the drivers and the fans, the, the teams and the fans, just because of how patient they'd been all week. I can absolutely relate to them how they, how they feel about the sport. Bloody brilliant day. Belgium, I think, was a turning point in the race. We were very, really strong and uh, compared to the car we had at the beginning of the season, I was able to play a little bit more and manipulate the car the, more to the way that I like. And Singapore, I love Singapore, to keep you know, the focus until the end is really, really difficult. Whereas Abu Dhabi has been quite a good place for us in the past, uh, on that day, on that particular day, it wasn't. We decided to start from the pit lane because we changed the car uh, for the race. And I remember going in to see Sebastian, who was playing on an electronic drum kit, you know, just before, an hour before the race, just to wish him luck. And uh, he said, I'll see you on the podium. And I thought, crikey, he's he's confident and I said to the to the guys on the radio before the race that you know whatever position we are in is what we are now, is where we are now but uh, we have to keep pushing and fighting until the end and if we do that from you know deep inside us until the end we cannot fail anybody that has any doubt over Sebastian Vettel not being able to go wheel to wheel with people put absolutely allied that there and he's driven some fantastic races this year but that one I think was one of the best of his career. The way we wrapped it up was not in the style that we probably would have liked to have done. It was a funny one because this Constructors Championship has been by far the hardest of the three. To finally achieve it in Austin was phenomenal but the race itself was slightly disappointing for us. Fernando was on the podium again, but it was effectively a match point that had been lost in the Drivers' Championship. Your immediate feeling is, we've lost the race. But to counter that is, but we've won the Constructors' World Championship. It's a huge, huge, huge achievement. But within the garage back here in, in the factory, um, there was a feeling that the job's only half done.
I had no time to think about anything else. I said before the race that I don't want to know where you know, Fernando is and what we have to achieve. And because if you have a chance to win, you try to win. It was the most horrendous race with the weather, then Sebastian being turned around at, uh, on the first lap, hit heavily, damage to the car, thinking that was it. Then him getting going again, fighting his way back through. Then there being more rain that, that came, changing onto inters, back to slicks, a radio that didn't work. Sebastian arriving in the pits with us not knowing what tyres he wanted, getting onto another set of inters for the end and him working his way up into the necessary position that he needed. And um, it was maximum stress from start to finish, but, uh, but he did it. 10 laps to go, I, I had the call that where we currently are is enough, cross the line and obviously then was told it was enough. Replied, but they couldn't hear me because <laughs> the radio failed as well in the race. Um, yeah, and then it was one of those things again where you just feel empty, but this time so much more because it was such a long season, you know, to start with. So many races, ups and downs, a difficult start. Uh, we had the penalty in Hockenheim, you know, it was a couple of points. The alternator in, in Valencia, a lot of points. Uh, a couple of points in, in Monza. And then to cross the line or just generally having succeeded and everything just falls off, you know, and it just, in a way you don't even have the power to maybe realize what happened or the power to celebrate the way you probably thought or dreamt of. That picture just an hour or so after we'd um, crossed the line in Interlagos for Seb's third championship. Actually the picture on my face is probably exhaustion. Now you're free, you know, you're free to relax, to be tired, to, yeah. Yeah. To get three World Constructors Championships on the bounce, I think your mind does drift to Adrian because Adrian is a very powerful influence. What he's achieved is quite phenomenal. I think he's, he's now arguably the best ever designer in Formula One. I think he surpasses what even Colin Chapman achieved. All those micro mini decisions that Adrian makes along the way. You know, you can see him ticking away, you know, two or three months ahead and asking Seb and I questions and then, you know, two or three months later there's something that pops up and you just think, wow, that's what he was on about back then. So I don't think it's any secret that our car is one of the hardest cars to work on. And that's how Adrian just does things, is just you've got to get on with it. So the boys are destroyed. You know, he is absolutely relentless um, in his desire for excellence, in his desire to keep improving, improving the car. 2012 has been one of the toughest seasons I've been through. Looking back, thinking of the race in Brazil, looking back, standing on the wall in Japan, looking back, you know, crying and feeling completely empty in Abu Dhabi, this is what you, you know, what, what no one can take away from you. And uh, I think this will last probably until the last day I'm on this planet. Yeah, to, to look back and, and realize what we have achieved as a team in the last three years. Winning is one thing, but to maintain those standards, to maintain the position at the front is incredible and the pressure that goes with that. It was the toughest championship to win in constructors wise, but in terms of our consistency, in terms of how the team have stayed together for, for that long, I mean to get three was certainly not easy as a team. If you imagine now that stop now, it's still a, a lifetime achievement and I, you know, I hope that in my life there's still so much more to come. Things on the racetrack, but you know, there's also a lot of things off the track, you know. One day you want to have a family, you know, kids, and I think, you know, I'm looking forward to those kind of things. I can honestly say that uh, my years at Red Bull have been an incredible ride and a very joyous one.